Fellow time travellers, how the devil are you? As well as can be expected, I hope. It's lovely to have you with me as we make this journey together through space and time. Ah, this week's episode has got an air of mystery. It takes us to a beautifully barren stretch of coastline where secrets are hidden and special agents prowl and groundbreaking science is undertaken as a cold war descends across Europe. To help support us in this whole podcast series and to get great exclusive content every week, sign up to my patreon.com site, why don't you? It's dead easy, go to patreon.com, look for me by name uh, and part with a bit of cash. You can join for a month or you can join for a whole year and it's cheaper by the dozen. Sign up, go on, spoil yourself. It'd be great to see you there. Okay, that's the advert over. It's now time to strap into the time machine. Well travelled as it is, as we set off to the next stop in my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music, why don't you? In the vicinity of those buildings, with those rusting radio masts, the Cold War feels very, very real. In this episode, a frightening wave of fear rolls across the world as the Cold War raises its ugly head. On a lonely, almost forgotten spit of shingle, one of the largest in Europe, British and US military scientists got down to work a place of stark, isolated beauty that's tucked away from prying eyes. The perfect place for conducting secret experiments. Shrouded in mystery, with strange buildings and lights, rumours of UFOs ran rife amongst the locals. Revolutionary parachutes and Britain's first atomic bomb are developed here. And with Cold War tensions rising, a ground-breaking radar system to tackle the Soviet threat is developed as the fear of nuclear war takes hold. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. In the last episode, we got a chilling reminder of just how close Hitler came and an ugly glimpse of what a Nazi victory would have been like. Where are we this week? Paul, we're moving from one global war threat to the next. Um, once the threat of Hitler's fascism had been swept away, two powerful ideologies were left, communism and liberalism, and they went head to head creating what we remember as the Cold War. This week, we're on Orford Ness in Suffolk, at the secret military base where next generation weapons and a radar system called Operation Cobra Mist were being developed. The location of the love letter this week, Paul, is Orford Ness in Suffolk. We've actually been more or less here before in terms of the geographical location. Orfordness is, um, well, it's a, a spit of shingle, actually, off the, the Suffolk coast. One of those ridges of big pebbles, basically, that builds up on account of a process called longshore drift. The pebbles, they originate from further north, places like Dunwich, and the tide pulls them down and they, they get pulled south along the coast and they build up and wave action and all the rest of it gradually forms a ridge. And so Orford Ness is one of those. Later on, at the end of the love letter, we'll be at Dungeon S in Kent, which is another shingle spit. And its formation is down to similar processes. They're actually incredibly rare. Those sort of shingle habitats, environments, whatever you want to call them, on a worldwide, Europe-wide basis, they're very rare. They're very fragile 
and those that Britain has, you know, add up to a noticeable <laughs> proportion of shingle spits. So they're, they're a fleetingly fragile natural product. So Orford Ness is, is a special place for that reason and for that reason alone. But when I say that we've been there before, uh, it's because regular listeners might remember Aldborough, which is also Suffolk. Aldborough is the place of the annual music festival. It was made famous by Sir Benjamin Britten, who wrote Peter Grimes, pr probably the most famous British opera, all sort of based and inspired by that landscape. But really the reason for Aldborough being in the love letter was because in the 16th century it was a major, major centre of shipbuilding. Really, really important. And in fact, in 1577, that was where the keel was laid down for a ship called the Pelican, which became part of a flotilla that sailed around the world under the guidance of Francis Drake. And, well, the Pelican, which was his flagship, he renamed it after his principal sponsor, whose heraldic crest was a golden hind, a golden deer. So the Golden Hind went round the world with Sir Francis Drake. Well, he wasn't a sir when he left, but when he came back, it had been such a profitable exercise. Queen Elizabeth's share of the, of the booty enabled her to pay off the national debt in one go. And famously, legend has it, whether it actually happened or not, he was certainly made Sir Francis Drake. Apparently it happened on the deck of the ship on his return. There were three years they were away. And Aldborough is in that same vicinity. You know, the, the shingle that forms the beach at Aldborough continues on. Orford Ness, Ness is nose. It's an old word. It means it's, it's got the same root as nose. And it's because it's that pointy bit that sticks out into the sea. So it's like the tip, the southern tip of the spit is really Orford Ness. Orford nose. But the whole, the whole spit... I think it adds up in total surface area. I think the, the shingle spit is, it must be nudging two and a half thousand acres. But it's really the tip of it that's the ness. So people will have landscapes that appeal to them maybe more than others. I mentioned Dungeness, Orford Ness. I find those shingle spits incredibly evocative. At first glance, they look quite sterile because it's, I suppose, you know, to the unfamiliar eye, they look like just gravel, really, or piles of pebbles. But they're vegetated. They, they tend to be, or they are, habitats for all manner of growing things and insects. That's why they matter so much, these habitats. Uh, so they are absolutely abuzz with life. And Orford Ness is just, it's beautiful. It's very flat, very low-lying. That's partly why these things tend to be so fragile, because in the, in the face of a big storm, say, you know, a big, a big event at sea can punch holes in, in a shingle spit or take a whole mass of it away overnight. Very low-lying, but it creates this atmospheric landscape of mudflats and meandering streams and then these ridges of... In the main, I think it's flint that make up the most of it. I find it a haunting, a bit of a haunting landscape. And Orford Ness is perfect in that it has that kind of air of sleepy, hidden out of the way mystery. It lends itself perfectly to what happened on Orford Ness and why I was particularly drawn to it and fascinated by it. For the longest time, people just used patches of the spit for grazing cattle. It's in the vicinity of agricultural land, and, and so it, it was very sleepy and quiet, and you know people just came and, came and went from it, making an agricultural use of it. But really, I suppose, it first lent itself to something exciting during the First World War, precisely because it was isolated. The people down there call it the island. You know, the people who mostly live on the mainland, although the spit is, is connected, it's connected at Aldborough. That's where it extends from. But the people using it call it the island. 
And it has this air of being cut off and tucked away from prying eyes. And as is so often the case, that attracted the attention of the military. <laughs> the military quite often like to get up to things that can't really be overlooked by the civilian population. And right from the beginning, there was something secretive about the way the military were on the Ness. And the first people in really were the Royal Flying Corps. Now, at the time of the First World War, there was no Royal Air Force as such. Flight was new. But there were aircraft, and military types were quick to realise that being able to overfly your enemy, maybe drop things on them from above, keep an eye on them, they could see the application. Hence the formation of the Royal Flying Corps. And they practised on the Ness. I've always loved this story. There was a, a fellow called Everard Calthrop who knew that the Royal Flying Corps were there, making use of the place. He was a, a railway engineer and also, in his spare time, an inventor. And believe it or believe it not, he had designed a prototype parachute. Because obviously men in aeroplanes, <laughs> things go wrong. <laughs> and they, you know, what are you going to do? And he called the parachute that he had developed the Guardian Angel. The pilots, obviously, were very taken by the idea of the Guardian Angel. But the top brass decided against it because they thought that having a parachute would uh, erode the spirit of the men <laughs> because they might be inclined to bail out <laughs> early. <laughs> so they, they didn't take Calthrop up on it. Parachutes were an option before they were ever used, but the top brass of the Royal Flying Corps said, oh, don't be ridiculous. It'll, it'll make cowards of the men. So they didn't take them on. It was a bit like, it, there was a long tradition, because obviously the Flying Corps always had associations with the Navy. They talked about their craft, aircraft rather than sea craft. It acquired a lot of its thinking and a lot of its vocabulary from the Navy. And famously, for the longest time, it was not traditional for seamen of any sort, even fishermen, to learn how to swim because the thinking was, that was popular amongst captains, was if your men couldn't swim, they would take a lot more care of the vessel <laughs> because they wouldn't want it to sink from under them because it was all they had. So there was, there was always this thinking that, you know, you don't want the men being able to swim because they won't be so scared of the ship sinking. And likewise, the flyboys, you don't want them thinking that they can jump out and float gently back down to the ground. so at odds with the modern way of thinking. It seems so brutal and extraordinary. It will. There you go, that was the thinking. Let's keep the men very committed to the welfare of the craft, of the vessel. We don't want them abandoning it. We don't want, we don't want them swimming away into the lifeboats and we don't want them jumping out and landing safely on the ground. It's, it's, I think that says a lot about the way um, fighting men tend to be treated by the top brass. Talk about expendable. So, basically, Everard Calthrop was sent on his way. No thank you, we don't need your guardian angels here. And then the next figure that, and this is, this is more connected to what became of Orford Ness, there was an individual called Robert Watson Watt, and he conducted on the Ness early experiments with radar. And, and eventually, what he began to understand through work that he carried out at Orford Ness by the 1930s and the run-up to the Second World War, it formed the foundation, it enabled the creation of the chain home radar system that was so critical for the Battle of Britain. Without the chain home, which gave early warning of enemy aircraft, and, and then while the aircraft were in the air, it enabled everyone to keep tabs on who was up there. A lot of the preliminary elementary work, a lot of the understanding of what became radar as we have it, was pioneered on Orford Ness. And, you know, if anyone's interested in looking up Sir Robert Watson Watt, he's quite a fascinating character. You know, when you think about the kind of paradigm shift that's there, you know, we can take radar for granted. As kids, you know, you watch it in the movies. You watch these, you know, undersea sonar and radar in the air. This idea of being able to send out an invisible ray and then reinterpret the results to let you see 
things that would otherwise be invisible. We've grown up with that idea, but imagine envisioning that in the first place and then coming up with a way to do it. That's one of those things that just boggles my mind, that individuals like Sir Robert Watson Watt are, are sitting in their studies thinking, I know how we could see the invisible. <laughs> Uh, then, so that was the 1930s, there or thereabouts, radar. And then in the 50s, when Britain and the US obviously were practising with atomic bombs, there were experiments and tests carried out and buildings created. There's, there's a set of buildings that, that people call the pagodas. And inside those, they kind of have the look of, you know, like a Japanese pagoda. They don't really look like Japanese pagodas, but from a distance they suggest that, they suggest that shape. Those were just some of the buildings that were associated with carrying out tests. The bomb that was under development on Orford Ness was called the Blue Danube. And that was, so imagine, imagine that was happening there, you know, in this, in this rural idyll off the Suffolk coast, in a world that was obviously by that time, we'd had the, the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but atomic bombs were a mystery to the mass of the population. And yet there on sleepy Orford Ness, where once upon a time the Flying Corps had practised, where an, an individual had turned up offering early parachutes, where tests had been carried out to develop radar that were part of helping to win the war. And then again, in, in the same remote, quiet, sleepy place, atomic bombs were being tested, or, or some of the technology of atomic bombs were being tested there. You know, it wasn't as if great mushroom clouds were ever billowing into the sky above Orford Ness, but they were conducting experiments and trying to understand what effect atomic warfare would have. It was top secret then. Oh yeah, and the, and what what you've got there because of the the various things that were being you know aircraft were experimental when the flying corps were there, radar was a complete novelty when it was being tested there, atomic explosives complete novelty. And so it was all very hush-hush. And it meant that several generations growing up in the vicinity of Orford Ness, they knew that the military were coming and going and they were doing things on the Ness. But it was all conducted under a succeeding years and decades of secrecy. So an air of mystery began to descend on Orford Ness. It was a place that locals talked about and they wondered, and obviously for want of accurate information about what was actually happening on the nest, there was all sorts of talk. And it meant that amongst other things, Orford Ness became swept up into all the rumours about UFOs because there were lights in the sky. You know, there were, there were aircraft, there were things up, there were, there were lights on and people would see them, wouldn't have an explanation for them. There was much talk amongst the locals of um, the development of death rays. There was a belief that they were developing invisible beams, rays that could stop car engines. You know, you can imagine if you were driving along the road late at night in the dark, you know, on some little country road and your engine suddenly cut out and you told your story in the pub the next night and somebody was liable to say, well, that's Orford Ness. You were probably targeted by something mysterious. <laughs> So all of that, all of that meant that there was a general air of mystery and secrecy on Orford Ness when the military once again began developing something called Cobra Mist. It's great, isn't it? The atomic bomb was Blue Danube. Yeah. And then the next thing, top secret, super hush hush, for your eyes only, was Cobra Mist. And we'll get to exactly what it was. Now, that idea with radar already mentioned, the idea of being able to see what's out of range of your eyes and your ears, radar lets you see something else. And people have always been fascinated with that. But in 1967, the shingle spit at Orford Ness became the base of an ambitious project, a joint project between the US Army and Air Force, to literally try and see round corners or more accurately, to see beyond the horizon. But 
if you're looking out in a straight line, let's say the way Sir Francis Drake would have done from the bridge of the Golden Hind, you can only see to the horizon, and then whatever's beyond the horizon is out of sight, because it's beyond the curve. Well, that wasn't good enough. By the time of the 1960s, the world was in the teeth of the Cold War. That cold conflict that evolved between the US, the West and the Soviet Union. Desperate suspicion about one another. Both sides were armed with the atomic bomb. There was nothing but mistrust between these two great entities, these two great forces. And the great worry was, what if the Russians fired missiles at us? Or what if they sent aircraft armed with bombs? By the time they were over the horizon and visible, it would be too late. So the boffins were trying to develop something that would let them see around the curvature of the Earth. Literally to see around corners, to see what was invisible. And so this was what Cobra Mist was. It was over the horizon detection. O-T-H was the acronym, over the horizon. I mean, we grew up with it as well. You know, we, you and I grew up in whatever, the 70s and the 80s, and there was a continuation there of that fear of the four-minute warning. Remember that, the four-minute warning, yeah. which was all we were going to get if Moscow pressed the buttons. You'd have four minutes to do, well, whatever the hell you were going to do if hundreds of warheads were heading towards London and the rest of the cities of the UK. And so... It was this push for a longer reach of advance warning. So it starts in the late 60s, 1967, and once again, the locals living nearby see lorries, as they've seen before, the green painted military vehicles and all the rest of it. And they start coming and going. What they delivered, first of all, were hundreds, thousands of railway sleepers. And they were laid all in a row to create roads. You just lay Railway sleeper, railway sleeper, railway sleeper. They call them corduroy roads because they have that ridged effect. And so that was that was the first thing. They created these miles and miles and miles through the marshes so that the vehicles that needed to come and go could navigate their way across the, the softness, the, the sogginess of the ness. So that was the first thing that came in. And then gradually low-lying buildings were developed, not high-rise, things that, that were quite invisible within the landscape, windowless buildings, you know, surrounded by corrugated iron and built in low to the landscape, these things started to appear and it was within these that the technology was, was going on. And then what, what was also raised, which could be seen from certain positions, was an array of radio masts, because after all, it was radar. It was that kind of technology. And so if you imagine looking down on the, on the installation from above, there was a fan shape radiated out, or like a peacock's tail of radio masts going out, 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 tall. And they spread out 180, 200 feet tall, these radio masts laid out like a fan. And it covered an area of 700 acres, this radio sensitive array. And the whole thing was covered by a protective mesh. You know, a bit like the sort of thing that people would put down to keep birds off of seeds, except laid over the top of the radio masts and covering this whole area. Restricted access, you know, the general public weren't allowed on because you could restrict access to the nest because you had to come on via the neck. Well, you, you could take a boat across the little lagoon of water, but broadly speaking, there was just a narrow neck, so access could be controlled. Although it was on UK soil, it was US military personnel that patrolled it and provided the security. And inside these mysterious rooms, these darkened windowless rooms, the scientists and the technicians, there they were. The buildings are still there. These empty corridors, paint peeling off the walls, the scraps of paper lying about on the floor, you know, long after the place was abandoned. The, the, the stuff is still there, but it's like being in the underground lair of a James Bond baddie. It's got that kind of atmosphere about it. And for years, they went about experimenting, sending radio waves out into the atmosphere and trying to interpret the data that was coming back. 
ideally, what was envisioned was technology that would have enabled Orford Ness, the Cobra Mist, to watch aircraft and ships thousands of miles away, over the horizon. It was a big operation then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were at it for six years. Started in 67. That's the year I was born. And, well... There's all sorts of estimates. I've read figures like $150 million, which obviously in the late 60s is significantly more money than today. Like I say, I've seen $150, $200 million, but who knows? Who knows how much they spent on it? Military project, you know, these tend to be bottomless pits for money. But Cobra Mist never worked. (laughs) There's... That's the that's the short that's the short version of the story. It never did what it was supposed to do. It drove them up the wall because no matter what they did, no matter what adjustments and fine tunings that they did over the six year period, the whole thing was always knocked out by background noise, static interference that crowded out everything else. It's like the signals that they were looking for were faint but the locally generated background noise crowded out so that they were looking for everything through a fog. Talk about cobra mist. That's really what they ended up with. They found themselves inside a cloud of static. Eventually, they suspected foul play, actually, and rumours began to circulate that the Russians had found out about cobra mist and they had submarines off the coast transmitting disruptive signals. Or maybe some of the fishing boats that could be seen out on the horizon were actually Russian ships dressed up as trawlers, sending out some kind of signal to disrupt whatever was going on at Cobra Mist. No one ever got to the bottom of it, no one ever found out anything. The Russians were up to no good, it was never proved. And just six years later, it started in 67, by June 1973 it was abandoned. But the the site wasn't completely abandoned. For the longest time, it was the base for broadcasting the BBC World Service for a lot of years. And then subsequently, I think, coming up into the 90s and later, I think BBC World Service relocated and private radio broadcast companies also made use of the site. It's it's abandoned now and it's just got the best, oddest atmosphere. The shingle, all the vegetation, mud flats, meandering rivers, it's all very mysterious. It's a perfect place for running about playing them and us games of hide and seek and it's beautiful beautiful place beautiful location but it has this air of maybe there's a sadness there as well because obviously what was going on there was about fear the cold war people living in a a, in a state of semi-paranoia preparing for the worst and to some extent there's maybe there's maybe an atmosphere of that that still hangs around the place like another kind of mist altogether And the radio masts are still there, best of all. And they look like desiccated big stick insects caught in a spider's web. You know, they're rusting and they're abandoned and there they are, these desiccated bones casting shadows. When you're there, people of our generation, I think particularly, you know, we grew up through the Cold War and the four minute warning and and worrying about attack by the Russians and attack by the Soviets. Well, on Orford Ness, in the vicinity of those buildings, with those rusting radio masts, the Cold War feels very, very real. What does the natural landscape of Orford Ness say to you personally? There's something about those habitats, those environments, those landscapes. Over and over again, they remind me of the fragility of Britain. Because you sense that there on, on those parts of the edges of the coastline you can l- see the shape of the archipelago fraying in real time. You know, the sea giveth and the sea taketh away. And you get that sense of, of the shape of the archipelago being drawn and redrawn moment by moment. And you get that feeling that Britain's not finished. It's not permanent, it's a work in progress and standing where the sea is lapping or sometimes tearing at those shingle pebbles, you get a real sense of Britain as a temporary place in the great scheme of things. Three 
tiny islands with the power to capture any heart. One with a customs house and a royal square. Another with a self-styled king who swapped gifts with Queen Victoria. A constitutional anomaly governed by Jersey. Long a secret hideaway for 17th century smugglers. Bright white sands and crystal clear water. Enchanted islands where it's possible to glimpse magic. A place that will steal your heart and certainly has mine. Next time in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It'd be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. And do please write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Neil Oliver and Paul Ratcliffe for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place.